So hi, this is uh, Jeff and Stuart. This is our first first go around, Jeff. Uh, yeah, to, it's exciting. We have been stuck in COVID America and uh, missed Azra, missing all our conferences, missing all our friends. Uh, sad, sad times. Yeah, so we thought we would uh, start a little uh, video series of talks about regional anesthesia. We won't really call it a show. It's a bit embarrassing because we don't really know what we're doing here. Yeah, we're not setting the bar too high here. Yeah. Okay, so. But, but we think it should have a name. Yeah, it's got to have a name. So, but we haven't really thought of a name. Apart from my one, which was um, uh, Developing Anesthesia for Teaching. That, yes. No, 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 we need to think of another name. Okay. We need to think of something better. We'll, we'll leave that out there. I don't know if Andy's thought of a good name for a kind of a video log. Yeah, help us out here, guys. Operators are standing by. What, what should the push, push should the ring? We haven't thought that far ahead. Yeah, we'll let you know. Okay, <laughs> so, but we wanted to talk about something we've both got asked a lot um, from residents uh, and often attendings. Uh, tonight's topic is why should I do a regional anesthesia fellowship? This is, this is something that I get asked a lot. Um, not infrequently, a resident will come up to me and say, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure what anesthesia fellowship I want to do, but uh, so-and-so is telling me, nah, you don't need to do a regional fellowship. And once I settle my blood pressure down, I sort of think about how I want to respond to that. And I respond differently depending on how much I like the person or whether I want to shut them into a, a cardiac fellowship or a, or a regional fellowship, et cetera. But, um, but it's, it's, it's a question that I do take seriously. And I have, I have some thoughts on it and I'm sure you yeah, get the same. I've had it from, from attendings yep. um, who know that regional fellowship, um, who are at a course needing to learn regional blocks. So there they are taking their time away from the family. They don't know what they're doing and they come there and go, I don't think you need to do a regional fellowship. I said, well, why, <laughs> why are you here? <laughs> So yeah. what are the reasons? If somebody, if somebody asks, if a resident asks, and let's assume that uh, somebody that you and I would love to have in our program, and it's, that's probably you out there. <laughs> we have your eye on you. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think one of the major reasons is the scope of regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine has just ex exploded in the last decade. And um, you know, there was a time when uh, you know back when we trained in the 1800s, where there were you know six blocks: interscaling maybe supercal vicator, axillary, fem, sciatic, and uh, an ankle block. And that, that was kind of it. Maybe if you're fancy from one of those fancy places, you do like a lumbar plexus or a paravertebral. But and it was kind of, and my impression was it was kind of seen as a, as a throwaway. Like if you can do that, that's fine. And it's maybe it's good for the patient. But general anesthesia is what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to carry on with that. So, but you know, ultrasound has really pushed things forward in the last 20 years, obviously, and then other innovations like fascial plane blocks and and um, and and reflection on outcomes and how regional anesthesia is not just a fancy trick or a, something to something to do to while away the hours, but it actually changes outcomes. As, as it, that's why I went into it. So I had a, an open nightingale ward, and one half was consultant anesthetist who did nerve blocks for so total really, joints. So really the 1800s. <laughs> this hospital, yeah, uh -huh, was built in Victorian times. One side was a consultant who did blocks. The other side was the guy who said general anesthesia never fails. And he didn't do any blocks. Right. One side were reading the paper, getting the evening meal. And the other side, or it was either like the battle of the song, they were moaning and screaming, or right. uh, they were yakking up into a bowl. And there was the experiment. There was the outcomes experiment. And one of the reasons I said, I need to learn how to do this. Um, and um, and then when you start, um, the, the, I learned so much more in the fellowship. And I, um, I, rather than just thinking they'll work, it was knowing they'll work. And then when you know they'll work, you're much more confident to step forward and do it. And it's just a great thing, I think, to have in your back pocket for when the really sick patient comes in. Uh, that others are frightened of, you can often do the block and it, and it gets you through with those sick, sick vascular surgery patients. Yeah. Saying they're not fit for a haircut, let alone an anaesthetic, the, the block's going to get you through. Yeah. I mean, we have hip fracture patients every week that have severe pulmonary hypertension and all kinds of other cardiorespiratory issues. And that would be a really difficult general anaesthetic to do. But having these arrows in your quiver, it just... Uh, 
make you really, really valuable at a time when it really, really counts. Mm -hmm. And um, But getting back to the scope, I think just coming out of a residency and expecting to be competent in now not just six, but all of these different techniques is unreasonable in 2020. And I often find that the person who's chosen a, an OB or cardiac fellowship is have never done a regional fellowship is telling the first year resident, oh, you don't need to do that. And of course that reflects their own choices. Um, doesn't necessarily reflect, you know, contemporary practice or current practice. And uh, with the explosion in the number of nerve blocks, I think if you're regionally trained, it's difficult to keep up, keep up yeah. let alone um, uh, if you're not regional trained. Uh, it's now like ESPs, they're so last week, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> what are the reasons, what do you have? I. I think if you want to go into um, an academic or, or a private practice, there's loads of job opportunities. I know mm. there are a lot of opportunities to come up for cardiac trained anaesthetists. And think about this, why are there a lot of jobs? That's because a lot of them start, and after two or three years, people want to get off the cardiac rotor. So, because it's just so hellish. But, um, and it's not the actual job in itself, it just wears you down after so many years. Um, but there's always room and skills for people who have got reason on these skills, and either private practice or or an academic. So some private practice will not. I mean, if people are going through a ridiculous stage where they're running a huge number of rooms, regional is just often not possible if they're if they're really really busy. But um, but it's, it's interesting. I see more. I hear of more and more practices now like that that are doing the math and making the investment into keeping somebody off out of the OR as a regional Yep, and I, I, if you are that busy, you can yeah. cover the cost of that uh, FTE yeah. and cover the cost of that salary. And uh, quite a few folks have done that very successfully. Yeah. So I think, I think um, yeah, don't talk to the fellows in the program, or if you don't have a fellowship at your program, uh, talk to fellows who train other programs and ask them about their experience as a resident and their experience as a fellow. It's great to hear advice from somebody going into chronic pain or going into another uh, cardiac or OB, but I should try and get that advice from people who've done a fellowship, I would say. Mm -hmm. I agree with you about the job opportunities. I mean, thinking back at the number of fellows that I've had emerge from our programs and have gone on to right away become the director of regional mm -hmm. anesthesia at their center, be it an academic center or a private practice. It's it's astounding. Some of the stories had a girl who, who we trained and she was like, she was the magician. She went to a practice, <laughs> they had done a regional and uh, you know, yeah, um, and be a rock star. But uh, anything else? Yeah, I think I think another reason is it, it plugs you into that network of regional anesthesiology people. In, mm -hmm. in, the, in the country and in the world. And if, if you think about, you know, a fellow going to present their poster at ASRA or do a workshop with regional anesthesia attendings and you're sort of the junior person on that team, you're um, getting exposure to some really um, cool, keen people that are, are going to remember who you are. And that it sort of kickstarts that your um, entree into the, into the community. It's a small community um, mm -hmm. and um, it's, a good, it's a good community too. It's, no, I enjoy the, I enjoy yeah. going to ESC, but I really enjoy Azra. Um, the family yeah. f family feeling at that meeting is just about the right size. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I know what you mean. It, it, networking is key, and I think it's great to have a network when you get to practice. There's so many things you don't really consider as a resident in, in terms of running a rotor, billing and reimbursement. You know how to han handle uh, different uh, practices, be it an ambulatory outpatient or hospital type setup. Do you have a pain service? Are you running it or not? And I think you get locked in early and you've got answers to mm -hmm. these questions and help all around. Agree. And I, you know, I think opportunities beget opportunities. And so the more you do, the more you'll ask to be collaborating with somebody at another institution or helping to write a paper or um, teaching other workshops and that sort of thing. And, and you don't, to be fair, I've, I know a few people who can do that and have done that without a fellowship, but it's it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, one that you like, and, and the actual. So when the fellow became ACGME, I was like, oh, they're, 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 you know, some of the changes I wasn't sure about, but I think it's the best thing that's actually happened to to the fellowship and mm -hmm. providing structure. One thing you comment on is actually your story. Um, you are made to do research. And yeah, you're an incredibly yeah. successful researcher. From so, what had you done before you started in research-wise training before you did 
Yeah, what did we do? nothing. And so I was, I was probably heading down the private practice track. And I think one of the wonderful things about fellowship is it, it gets you, um, it, it sort of forces you to do research mm-hmm. under the direction of a mentor. And but that, that mentorship for that year, that close confines and that developing those professional relationships, I think it's very, very hard to do that. And, uh, and, and look, it's not for everybody. Not everyone is going to do research and, and, and be an academician. But I think part of the value of fellowships is giving you that taste and seeing if you've ever run with that. But also being able to properly interpret the, the literature and know, yeah. and know what is good and what is bad. And, and now you, you could be like, uh, wheat just blowing in the wind, this new block, that new block, and you pinball, you're bouncing from place to place, you've done six and you're an expert and now you're on the next block. It allows you to evaluate yeah. some of the literature's published and maybe sometimes go a little bit slower when it's required rather than just changing <laughs> direction with the newest... Uh, C1, do one, tweet one. Yeah. yeah. C1, do one, tweet one. Yeah, so that's a good reason. I think I, I give our fellows a talk at the beginning of every year about that. and said, look, I, I, if I had to guess, I, I'd say, you know, if half of you end up doing an academic career, that's, I think that's great. Um, and uh, But I want all of you to at least have tried it and say, no, nah, not for me, or, yeah, this is the best thing uh, since I, sliced bread. I, I wonder when we come out um, of this COVID funk, um, where's the money going to be for attending meetings if you're not presenting, if you're not actually presenting research? And it, it, one of the things I, I try to talk to fellows about is there's a, a million people with a cool haircut and an ultrasound probe that want to be teaching at workshops, but you know, we really want the people that write the research and, and know what they're talking about. Some really study the the ones that are teaching at these at the workshops. It's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? How you we see everyone's got an opinion. I guess that's life in the twenty first century. You know, like assholes. Everybody's got one. <laughs> <laughs> As usual, you're more eloquent than I. <laughs> so, um, but it's it, it yeah, it's easy to have an opinion, but it, I want to learn a new block from someone who's mm-hmm. studied it on cadavers kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's, um, and I, yeah, you get that opportunity to a fellowship, which yeah. I, I, again, it's one of those things you do anatomy early in medical school. Um, one of my favorite questions is, is you asking those residents who say you don't need a regional fellowship. I, I often ask them to draw, just draw the brachial plexus. And it's often amazing how, uh, sweat starts pouring down their faces. <laughs> uh, it, do I have time to a bathroom break for? <laughs> Can I use my phone? If you want to have a, a good, solid career and, and do a lot of regional anesthesiology, I think fellowship is um, really, really important to have. Yeah. And one of the things I enjoy is my network of fellows who are now all around uh, the country um, and friends all around the country. And uh, it's it, it really expands on your residency class. The, yeah. the, the folks meeting fellowship is another special bond. Um, it really is. Uh, like when you go to the, go to the meeting, and like those are the people that I want to yeah have a yeah. drink with. Yeah. Yeah. Shenanigans oh, and shoes. Well, that's part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Good job of convinced MD. Uh, let us know again. Tweet us. <laughs> yeah. Let us know if you've, you've, you're committing to a UNC or a Duke fellowship. Yeah, and the two best places in the country, of course, are UNC well, and Duke. It goes without saying. Uh, and, uh, you know, North Carolina is a fantastic place to, to learn. But uh, if you get any questions, leave a comment um, or uh, contact us via email uh, or through Twitter. Uh, and uh, I'm Stuart Grant. I'm Jeff Gansen. And thanks for listening. Thank you.